Welcome to the fifth episode of our journey through the worst gaming cards. Today, we'll be taking a look at the first 3D card from a rather successful company named ATI. The card itself can be obtained easily and inexpensively, unlike competing products of the era such as Nvidia's NV1 or Creative's 3D Blaster, the prices of which have skyrocketed in recent years. It seems like almost no one is interested in this model, despite the fact that it's the first in a line of products that ended up becoming very successful, thanks to some of its later outings. There are a bunch of good reasons for this disinterest, and we will take a look at them. But first, as always, we'll begin with a quick look into the company's long history. ATI was founded by three engineers from Hong Kong in August of 1985 in Canada as a Ray Technology Incorporated. From the onset, the goal was to enter the lucrative market of selling video adapters or video cards for IBM PC compatibles. By October, the first such product was ready, and ATI sold it as the Color Emulation Card, allegedly exclusively through OEM channels, with Commodore and K-Pro being some of the likely companies that picked it up. We use the words allegedly and likely because not a whole lot is known about this card. In fact, despite many fans searching for one, a photo of it doesn't seem to exist online. So if you happen to own such a card or have a photo of it, we'd appreciate it if you shared it in the comments. Thanks to OEM sales, ATI hit $10 million in revenue by the end of the year. So, beginning in 1986, they started diverging from the OEM market exclusivity and aimed towards the end user with a newly developed card dubbed Graphic Solution. This card had a lower price than competitors, 64 kilobytes of memory and support for four video standards. In 1987, the line was refreshed with the Plus and SR revisions, using SRAM instead of the more commonly used DRAM. The technology powering the cards was still the same, so the company had yet to create a product that supported the merging EGA standard. That changed soon though with the release of the high-end EGA Wonder. Cards in this line of products were available at a range of different price points, depending on the model selected, as well as 256 kilobytes of memory and ironically a chipset from one of ATI's rivals, Chips and Technologies. A later model dubbed VIP even offered limited compatibility with the then brand new VGA video standard. 1988 brought two new chips and many different models based on them. The first one was the low-end Hercules clone with 64 kilobytes of memory named Small Wonder Graphic Solution. More importantly, however, the second one was the high-end VGA Wonder using ATI's new 18800 chipset with up to 512 kilobytes of memory and proper support for the VGA standard. In 1990, a new, more universal chipset, the 28800, was released. It too powered a wide variety of cards from the low-end VGA Basic 16 and VGA Charger products equipped with 256 and 512 kilobytes of memory accordingly, to high-end models, VGA 1024D and VGA Wonder XL, both of which sported a whopping 1 megabyte of memory. ATI also released another card based on the same chipset, this time attempting to make an entrance into the multimedia market. Dubbed the VGA Stereo FX, this card offered a conventional graphics core with either 512 kilobytes or 1 megabyte of memory, combined with a sound card portion and even a mouse connector. A standalone sound card was also released based on this design. However, both the VGA Stereo FX and sound card suffered from a lack of features, such as a CD-ROM drive connector or even real stereo, and were not very successful as a result. Another very important release was the Mac 8, which arrived in 1991. The Mac 8 was a graphics coprocessor compatible with IBM's 8514 standard. This allowed ATI to compete in the high-end CAD and Windows Accelerator market with their add-on card named 8514 Ultra. This card featured a dual bus interface, ISA or MCA, 
IBM's microchannel architecture, but with it being solely an accelerator, it required another card for unaccelerated VGA modes. The Graphics Vantage and Graphics Ultra variants came later and combined two chips on one PCB, with the difference between the cards being the type of memory used. The only disadvantage was the relatively low amount of memory as each chip needed its own modules, which were not shared between chips. These issues were solved a year later with the release of the Mac 32, which combined both chips' features in a single chip solution and increased maximum memory size up to 4 megabytes. The Mac 64 CX and GX based cards were released in 1994, and as the name implies, they offered a 64 bit bus and it also had basic MPEG video acceleration. In 1995, ATI released just one chip, the Mac 64 CT. This was a cost reduced variant with an integrated RAM DAC and was usually limited to just 2 megabytes of memory. But something big was announced in November of that year, and that was the company's first 3D chip named 3D Rage, with a spec sheet mentioning a texel rate of over 20 million texels per second, the ability to draw 600,000 triangles per second, as well as offering MPEG video acceleration. With support for up to 4 megabytes of EDO, SD and SG RAM, as well as an integrated RAM DAC, this chip seemed to be the ideal low-cost 3D accelerator. Distribution began in March of 1996, mostly through OEM channels such as IBM with their Aptiva line of computers and NEC's power player. The retail version of the card was named 3D Expression and appeared later that year, along with three bundled games, for the price tag of 219 US dollars. This was later lowered to just 179 US dollars in 1997, but by this point the card was hopelessly outclassed by the competition. The 3D Rage launched alongside another chip, the Mac 64 VT, with which it shared the same 2D core and enhanced video stretching over full screen. Unfortunately, it seems like ATI was attempting to meet OEM expectations rather than end users. 3D Rage used the same reference PCB as the cheaper Mac 64 VT because the chips were pin compatible. This decision resulted in a much less desirable product compared to the press release announcement of the previous year. For one, memory was limited to just 2 megabytes of EDO RAM. 4 megabytes of SD RAM or SG RAM configurations became a reality only once the updated Rage 2 chip got released much later. An even more serious issue was the lack of some basic 3D features, such as a Z buffer and support for palletized textures. This is likely because the chip was developed and finalized before DirectD was even released, with the first version hitting the scene in June 1996. Without a common or universal API available, ATI had to create their own, and they ended up calling it the ATI 3D C interface. Unfortunately, unlike other proprietary APIs, ATI's endeavor wasn't very successful, with only 14 games offering support for it. In fact, some of these games require newer chips, such as the Rage 2 and Rage Pro which came out later. Well, now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to our card. It's ATI's 3D expression running at 44 MHz. Memory is limited to just 2 MB of EDO and texel rate is quite low compared to a Voodoo 1. The 3D Rage chip of course beat the Voodoo 1 to the punch by about a year and was also a much more low cost product, especially once you factor in that the Voodoo 1 is an add-on card. Despite this, the Voodoo 1 would go on to become the golden standard at the time, so our card will be tested against a Diamond Monster 3D utilizing 3DFX's Voodoo graphics chipset with 4 megabytes of EDO memory clocked at 50 megahertz. First, we're going to take a look at the driver options. After the installation is over and one reboot later, you're greeted by ATI's desktop help, which is really nothing more than a few lines of basic instructions on how to control 2D settings in Windows. The drivers offer a nice set of 2D options, but no 3D options to speak of. Only Power Strip shows us some basic options and chip clocks.
Now, we usually start with synthetic benchmarks, however, in this case, there is a small problem. Final Reality won't detect any 3D rendering devices and only offers a software renderer, whereas 3D Mark 99 will not run at all. But synthetic benchmarks are not the only ones thinking that the 3D Rage should have probably been called the 2D Rage. Incoming crashes with a no alpha format found error. And Turok is trying to load using a DLL file program for the ATI Rage Pro chip, which is about two generations newer and just fails. Expendable crashed too because it expects a Z buffer and as we already discussed this is not something that the 3D Rage offers. Wipeout 2097 crashes to the desktop due to some unknown error and Subculture is unable to start any display devices which probably means it can't detect any 3D accelerators. Warhammer Dark Omen runs solely in software rendering and doesn't allow you to switch to 3D accelerated rendering. Croc supports ATI's 3DC interface, among other forgotten APIs, but sadly that was only in the original retail version. Later versions of the game were patched and offered direct release support instead, alongside a software renderer and glide support. This is the version of the game that we own and unfortunately, after attempting to load the main menu, it just crashes. Tomb Raider 2's demo runs, however, no textures are displayed, which certainly leads to a far less charming presentation. At last, without muddy textures, horny gamers worldwide will have an undisturbed view at Lara's, um, polygons. Frame rate looks good for the most part, but in more complex scenes, it can fall to a mere 15 frames per second, which is pretty sad considering the visual sacrifices. Forsaken also runs, however the card is just too slow at 640x480. The lack of memory also leads to some missing textures. At 320x240 however, the frame rate is much better and all textures are rendered properly. Carmageddon 2 is unplayable, even on the lowest details. In fact, changing them doesn't even make much of a difference because the frame rate increases from 4 FPS to a whopping 6 FPS. Visual quality suffers a lot too, thanks to broken transparency and unfiltered textures.
We couldn't get the frame counter to show in Half-Life, but in this case, it doesn't really matter. Shimmering textures are everywhere, and the game is painfully slow. IF-22 Raptor is a typical early 3D accelerated flight simulator. It seems playable, but the only time the frame rate rises above 20 is when you're flying straight through the clouds and have nothing else on your viewport. The Voodoo here suffers from the classic texture bug caused by our faster CPU. MDK looks mostly fine, but we had to use low quality textures and set Kurt, the game's main character, as a blit instead of a texture in the options. Otherwise, he suffers from missing transparency like blood and explosion effects. The built in benchmark shows roughly 10 times better performance on a Voodoo compared to a 3D Rage. Game is capped at 30 FPS though, so you won't be able to tell that kind of difference anyway. The FPS counter works only in Direct 3D mode, where again the Voodoo suffers from texture bugs, so we'll switch over to Glide for proper visual quality comparison.
Trying to run Unreal on such an early 3D accelerator with a measly 2 megabytes of memory available seems rather futile, but why not try it? To our big surprise, the Rage was actually able to produce some frames. We can't really call it running since it's more like someone's dragging it from the hair, however it gets an A for effort. As amazing as it is to see such an early 3D card quote unquote running Unreal, by this point you really just want to put the Rage out of its misery. We tried to change the resolution to the lowest available, which was 320 by 200 but this makes the game extra ugly and doesn't help a ton anyway, because we're still at mostly sub 10 FPS. By comparison, on our CPU, the software renderer at 640x480 looks and runs much better, at roughly 26 frames per second on average. With all that out of the way, it's time for our conclusion. The positive side will sit mostly empty today. There aren't many reasons to go out of your way to buy a 3D Rage. In fact, the only reason to look for one would be that it started the line of 3D accelerators from ATI. So in that sense, it should have a place in the collection of every ATI fan. But for retro gaming, it's only really the 2D portion of the chip that's of any usefulness, and only really if one wants to try something other than the very common S3 Trio and Verge cards. On the other side, the negatives seem endless. The card just doesn't have enough power, not only for 640x480, but even just for basic 320x240 resolutions. It's also missing some critical 3D features, like Z-buffering and palletized textures. This causes many games to crash instantly. Compared to that, missing transparency modes seem like a very minor issue. And the limited memory size is problematic not just for games, but also for desktop resolutions in case you want to use a monitor with high resolutions available. Because of its useless 3D performance and very bad compatibility, we award ATI's 3D Rage with only half a star. It was released too soon and it's just too slow for any kind of 3D retro games. That's all for today, thanks for watching. Usually for the end of the video we'll let you watch the demo of 3D Mark 99, however since that's not working this time around, we hope we can compensate with the demo version of X running on the 3D Rage.